Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. The old pros welcome you to tonight's selection of Old Time Radio. Our selections uh, tonight for the shows are comprised of three very popular shows. The first one, um, The Pickersons, and we're doing an episode of that show called The Honeymoon is Over. Uh, the Bickersons began in 1946 and ran until 1951. And while I'm on the Bickersons, before I forget, in your programs it mentions that um, Karen Elliott would be doing the part of Blanche on Sunday. However, that kind of switched totally around, so she, Karen is doing the part of Blanche tonight. And Cheryl Baker will be doing Blanche on Saturday and Sunday. Our second presentation of the evening is a wonderful, popular, and long-running show called The Great Gildersleeve. The show began in 1941 and ran until 1958. Now, to me, that's very intriguing because when the show began in 1941, I was only less than a year old, and it ran until I graduated out of high school. So that was 17 years, and I find that phenomenal. Any, any show, radio or TV or musical or whatever, that's run for 17 years in, in this business is a long, long time. The name of the episode tonight is called Income Tax Forms. And that was, um, uh, that was first broadcast in January of 1944. And if you keep up with today's news, income tax forms, well, that hasn't uh, swayed too far from being a topic of discussion to this day. Our third presentation after a short intermission is um, The Day the Earth Stood Still. That began its life in 1951 um, uh, on the big screen as a motion picture. In, 1940, uh, in 1954, the Lux Radio Theater broadcast it as a radio show. The movie was so, so popular that it became a classic. And in, in 2008, it, they remade the movie, and um, in December of that very same year, 2008, it premiered and debuted in over 50 countries across the world. So we're looking forward to that tonight. It's a good show. The old pros, we've been doing the radio shows, old-time radio, for 10 years, and we plan to continue to do them in the future. Because the scripts are really good, the actors are fantastic, and our innovative sound and Foley crew performing on stage is fabulous entertainment. So um, I, before I go off stage, though, I want to make two announcements. Number one, if you're not going to take your programs home with you tonight and frame them, hang them above your bed, and read them every night until next year, then what we would appreciate is for you to, on your way out, take them to the doors, and there are recycle bins there, and deposit them in the recycle bins. Secondly, if you have your f um, cell phones with you, uh, out of respect to the ca for the cast and your neighbor sitting next to you, please uh, take a moment now to turn them off or put them on silent or vibrate, um, and we'd appreciate that very much. Now, sit back, relax, allow yourself for the next two hours to journey back into yesteryear and have a good time. Enjoy the show. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to introduce you to Bill Reed and Karen Elliott as John and Blanche Brickerson in The Honeymoon is Over. The Bickersons have retired. It's 3 o'clock in the morning and Mrs. Bickerson lies tense and sleepless in the dark 
As poor husband John, victim of raucous insomnia, or wimp his malady, reaches a climax during an acute attack of his strange ailment, listen. He'll stop it now. I, I know he will. Oh, dear. John, turn over on your side. Go on. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. What is it, Blanche? What is the matter? What's the matter, Blanche? There isn't another woman in the world who'd sacrifice her youth and her looks to live with a man who rattles himself to sleep like a lot of old bones in a bag. What do you think I'm made of, John? Old bones? Oh, you've got to stop it. Stop what? That snoring. Oh, it's just your imagination, Blanche. I never snore. John Bickerson, how can you say that? Very easy. I never snore. I never snore. Never. John. 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 What's the matter? Why don't you let me sleep, Blanche? Well, what about me? What am I to do when you grind away like a buzz saw? I never sleep at all. You were fast asleep when I came home from my lodge meeting. <laughs> what time did you get in? I don't know. Put out the lights. You said you'd have one drink and get home at ten. Well, I had ten drinks and got home at one. <laughs> you knew where I was all this time. Now, don't go beefing about it. Well, I didn't know where you were, and I would have called you. What for? Because the express man came around again with that package. It's from Kentucky, and there's freight charges on it. Well, why didn't you pay him? I've been waiting for that package. What is it? It's my dividend. I belong to the Bottle of the Month Club. Oh, I'm just sick and tired the way your whole life is wrapped up in a bottle of bourbon. Maybe you'd like me better if I wore a label and put a cork in my mouth. You needn't wear a label, Blanche. There you go with your subtle insults again. When am I supposed to talk to you? You rush away in the morning and come home in the night when I'm sleeping. Sit up and talk to me, John. Blanche, I'm dead tired. I don't know what time I came home, but I was in the kitchen for over an hour. I know. I heard you puttering around in there. I wasn't puttering. You asked me to fix the electric toaster and the curling iron, didn't you? Well, I fixed them both. Do they work? They work fine, except the toaster pops up with a permanent. Oh, that doesn't surprise me. Did you turn off all the lights? Turned off the lights. I suppose you left a mess in the kitchen. No mess. Oh, I hope you locked the back door. The cat got out three times last week. Cat won't get out tonight. Where did you put him? In the birdcage. Oh, <gasps> birdcage? Where's the canary? In the cat. John Bickerson! Please, stop yourself knocking yourself out. Now, nothing happened to the canary, and the cat's fast asleep in the oven. <laughs> well, don't scare me like that. Are you sure all the animals are taken care of? I'm sure. Well, how about the gold, the fish bowl? Did you heat up the water for the new big, big gold fish? I heated his water, gave him his pablum, burped him twice, and changed his diapers. Would you please put out the lights and let me sleep? Why are you so cross and disagreeable all the time, because John? Because I'm exhausted. That's not true. You'd rather stay out the whole night carousing with your rough net friends. Just kills you to spend a night with me. Oh, it doesn't kill me. Oh, that's a funny thing, that I don't need anybody else. I'm always satisfied just, just to be with you. Well, you're in better company than I am. Good night, Blanche. Keep it up, John. Keep adding insult to injury. Never a kind word or a compliment. Just work me to death like a slave. Pick at my meals. Complain about my cooking. I never complain about your cooking. <laughs> then why didn't you eat that pie I made tonight? I did eat it. I ate, ate every bit of it. You didn't like it. I couldn't chew it. The underquest was like cardboard. Undercrust? Yes. <laughs> that pie didn't have any undercrust. I gave it to you on a paper plate. Well, the plate tasted better than the pie. Don't make me any more pies. I hate pies. I hate all the desserts, especially that orange meringue broccoli dream cake you make. Don't make me any more desserts. 
I never know what to make for you. You've got the weirdest appetite of any man alive. Yes, you're weird. <laughs> for two months running, you wouldn't eat anything but pig's knuckles. Pig's knuckles, pig's knuckles. What about it? <laughs> Just because you wanted pig's knuckles, I had to cook my fingers to the bone. Oh. Why don't you hire a chef? Oh, oh God. I cook for you, I scrub for you, I sew for you. Do I get any thanks? Thanks. Oh, thanks. <laughs> That's all the thanks I get. No love, no affection. How I envy Louise Shaw. Her husband treats her more like a friend than a wife. Well, settle down, will you, Blanche? No, I won't. You think Louise ever makes breakfast for Mel? Oh, not that lazy lump. She makes him go to work every day without a morsel of food. Just a kiss for breakfast. Would you be satisfied with that? Sure. Send her over in the morning. I mean, would you be satisfied if I gave you a kiss for breakfast? Blanche, I'd be satisfied with anything if you'd just let me get some rest. Answer me. Do you want a kiss for breakfast? Yes. <laughs> well, ask for it. Blanche, I want a kiss for breakfast. Don't do me any favors. I'll never let you kiss me again as long as you live. Not until you apologize. Apologize? For what? What have I done? Uh, well, it's not what you haven't done. You haven't told me you love me for years. Why don't you say you're sorry you married me? Because I'm not. Am I the only wife in the world for you? You're the only wife in the world for me. You're lying. Swear. I swear I'm lying. I mean, I'm not lying. Well, that's no way to swear. Say it nicely. You're the only wife in the world for me. Really, John? Really. I wouldn't have another wife like you for anything. I wish I'd known more about you before we were married. Oh, you knew everything. Oh, I didn't know about that tattoo you have on your butt. <laughs> it's a real indication to a man's character. I wish I'd known. Now, wait a minute. I had that tattoo put on my butt when I was just a silly kid. Oh, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. A hula girl with a big dimple in her chin. That dimple was there before she was. <laughs> don't go digging up my butt. It's this time of the night. Well, why don't you have that ugly picture removed? Okay, I'll have it removed in the morning. Oh, you say that, but you won't do it. Have it done now. What? Oh, go on. Get up and get rid of that hula girl. Are you out of your mind? It's almost four o'clock in the morning. Oh, you'd get rid of her quick enough if you were married to Gloria Goosby. Oh, no, don't get me started on Gloria Goosby. Well, she'd holly holler plenty if you didn't do what she liked. I always do what she likes, and she never hollers. I hate the sight of Gloria Goosby. I never want you to mention her name again. Do you hear me? Oh, don't yell at me. I'm sick. Sick? <laughs> Well, Dr. Hershey told me there was something the matter with my head. You don't mean to tell me you paid the doctor for that. You make fun if you like, but I know I won't last long. What's the matter with you? Nothing. Are you really sick? So sick I could die. I think I'm poisoned. I've got the most awful indigestion. Call the doctor, John. You don't need the doctor. I'll take care of it for you. Lie still, and I'll fry some radishes and hot sauerkraut juice. Radishes and hot sauerkraut juice? Finest cure in the world for indigestion. Lie still. Oh, John Pickerson, I don't want any of, any of your insane remedies. You'll, you'll treat me for indigestion, I'll probably die of liver trouble. Listen, if I treat you for indigestion, you'll die of indigestion. Now, do you want me to help you or not? Well, I'd feel a lot better if you just don't scream at me and tell me you love me. <laughs> I knew she wasn't sick. Tell me you love me, John. I love you. How much do you love me? How much do you need? <laughs> well, now, John, Easter Sunday's only two days away, and I haven't got a new hat. What happened to the hat you bought last Easter? Well, it's in a box on the dresser, but that hat's worn out. Well, where the box? You can't be squandering my money on Easter hats. Please, John, just this once, I saw a wonderful hat with a reversible brim that can be turned up 
or down. How much is it? Sixty dollars. Turn it down. <laughs> turn it down. Turn it down. Turn it down. I turn everything down because you're always looking for bargains. When you married me, you didn't get a bargain. How oh, well I know it. Oh, you know what I mean. You only like the kind of woman who would pass up a mink coat to buy a cheap fur. Well, what's wrong with buying a cheap fur? Oh, nothing. Would you like to see the one I bought? What? Dear? <laughs> it's a dyed rabbit choker. It only cost $94. $94 for a dead rabbit? Oh, don't get upset. Blanche, how can you squander my money like that? I deny myself everything. Last week, I had all my teeth pulled out so I could save money on eating. I've been sewing collars on your old bloomers and wearing them for shirts. I haven't even got a pair of pants. Yesterday, I hung a whisk broom from your plaid skirt and went to work dressed as a Scotsman. And you spend $94 on Easter rabbits? All right, all right, I'll take it back. I never knew you could be so mean. Oh, take it back. I wish my poor granddaddy was still alive. He'd never let you treat me like this. All of a sudden, she's got a granddaddy. I never heard you mention him before. Well, he was the best friend I ever had. Oh. I took his advice on everything. Oh, yeah, yeah. He could have settled a lot of our problems. I'll bet he'd tell you to let me keep that choker. How do you know? Because I know. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask him. Suppose he isn't in heaven. Well, then you can ask him. <laughs> Good night, Blanche. Good night, John. <laughs> Tonight's production is presented by Colgate Tooth Powder. No amount of money will clean your teeth or can buy you a dentifrice that will clean your teeth more quickly and thoroughly. Remember the name, Colgate Tooth Powder, with the accent on powder. Use Colgate Tooth Powder. morning and use it at night. Don't take a chance on your romance. Use Colgate Tooth Powder. Kraft presents the Great Gildersleeve. <laughs> The Kraft Cheese Company, who also bring you the Kraft Music Hall every Thursday night, present each week at this time Harold Perry as the Great Gildersleeve, written by John Wheaton and Sam Moore. We'll hear from the Great Gildersleeve in just a moment. You know, I've just learned from several mothers in the neighborhood that their meal panning problem is not three, but four meals a day. That is, if you count in the after-school snack, that means so much to healthy, growing children. Well, I found out, too, that many mothers make short work of that in-between meal. Along with a glass of milk, they serve a slice of bread spread with parquet margarine. And their youngsters are really satisfied. For parquet, the quality margarine made by Kraft is both delicious and nourishing. It's made to order for grown-up wartime appetites as well as for hungry youngsters. Yes, 
Pake margarine has become a favorite mealtime spread for bread because it has such a grand appetizing flavor and because it's one of the best energy foods you can serve. What's more, every pound contains 9,000 units of vitamin A. So buy it tomorrow. Pake, P-A-R-K-A-Y, Pake margarine, made by Kraft. Now, let's look it on in the great Gildersleeve. It's a cold winter Saturday, and he's at home occupying himself with some papers that look very important, while Leroy plays happily by the fire with his Christmas puppy. Yep, 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 yep. If you yep. claim a credit yep. in line 15, this regard lines 19A and B. Complete schedule L. On page four and enter the result on line 19C. Yep! Shiverish. Yep! Yep! yep, yep Has the yep, puppy yep, eaten this morning, yep. Leroy? Oh, sure. He ate and he ate and he ate. I wonder if I could put him down as a dependent. I suppose not. When are you going to help me build a house for him, Unc? A house? Not today, Leroy. But you promised. I know, but i got to get started on this confounded income tax. I thought it didn't have to be until March. Don't worry, it'll take till March to finish it. Let's see. If line 20 is larger than line 21D, enter the difference here and also as item 20, page 1, if not item 23. No. The dog is right. Line 20. Confounded, Leroy, you'll have to keep the dog quiet. This thing is very complicated. Well, if he had his own house, he could go there and not bother anybody. I can't build it today, my boy, but I've got to have quiet. Okay. Have to be quiet, Stinky. Yeah. What? What did you call the puppy, Leroy? Well, Stinky. That's his name. Since when? Since yesterday. Well, I won't have him call that. You'll have to find something more suitable. Aw, oh, gosh. He likes it, Unc. It suits him fine. If you'd give him a bath, it wouldn't be so appropriate. Why don't you go and give him a bath right now? It's bad for puppies to have baths in the winter. Nonsense. Who told you that? You did. Oh! Uncle Mort, has the mail come yet? Mail? I don't know, my dear. I haven't looked. Oh, what's the matter, Stinky? Marjorie! What did I do? I don't like that name for the puppy. Can't we get a more dignified name for him? Like what? He wants to call him Rover. I didn't say anything about Rover. Although Rover's a nice name for a dog. Here, Rover. Here, Rover. He doesn't seem to go for it. Well, you can't expect him to know it the first time. Here, Rover. Nice, Rover. Come to Uncle Mort, Rover. Rover. Don't you growl at me. He's not a mutt. He's an Airedale. An Airedale? Well, he behaves like a mutt. Oh, he can't help it. I'm going to get the mail. Yeah. Why don't you go somewhere too, Leroy, and take the dog with you? It's too cold to go out. What is there to do? Oh, go practice your piano. You haven't practiced all week. Okay. Come on, Stink. Um, come on, Rover. <laughs> Victory tax credit. Shoo, this is a Lulu. Here you are, Uncle Mort. Some lovely mail to cheer you up. Oh, what is it? A bill from Dr. Hargrave. Certainly didn't lose any time. Wonder what he'll have the nerve to charge me all those fancy instruments, complicated tests. Well, I won't pay for it. That's all, little robber. Well, what is it? For professional services. Two dollars? What do you think I am, a pauper? Leroy! Say, there's something about deducting medical expenses on your income tax. Uh, instruction 15. A deduction is limited to such expenses as... Uh, Le oh, Leroy! Oh, Leroy! Le Leroy, answer, Bertie. Confound it, I've got to have quiet here. Uh, uh, what do you want, Bertie? Did you feed Stinky this morning? Bertie! What's the matter, Mr. Gildersleeve? It's not the name I want the puppy called. It's very offensive. Oh, it is, sure, sure it is, but it fits him. What I want to know is, how long is he going to be sleeping in my kitchen? 
Yeah, if he had a dog house. Quiet! I've got to have absolute quiet here. Yes, sir. That's more like it. Now, single person not living with husband or wife, 25% less 2% for each dependent of line four with not more than $500 plus $100 for each dependent. By George, I give up. Come on, Leroy. Let's build a doghouse for Stinky. It's dark as a hat. Your hat down here. You go ahead, Leroy, and turn on the light. I will, if I can find it. It's right over where the workbench is. I know, but where's the workbench? Right under the light. Big help you are. Ouch. What's the matter? Oh, I bumped into something. Well, why don't you watch where you're going? Ow! Who left that there? What is it? It's my sled. What's your sled doing in the cellar? I was just polishing my runners. If I find it here again, Leroy, I'm gonna burn it. Now turn on the light. I've got it. There. Leroy, I told you to clean up this place way before Christmas. I did, Unc. You did? Just look at it. I know. Isn't it terrible? You clean up anything around here and right away, somebody messes it up. Yes, yes. It's discouraging. I give up. Let's go on with the doghouse. Yeah, let's. Here's a soapbox I've been saving. Soapbox? Oh, I thought we could cut a hole in one end for a door and oh. put a roof on it and... Oh. That's no good. Why not? In the first place, it's not big enough. We need something about three feet, six inches. Three feet, six inches? The dog's only a foot long. He would always be a puppy, you know. You have to remember we're building for the future here. Besides, whatever's worth doing well is worth doing well. Remember that. Get me one of those long boards over there. They got nails in them. We'll pull them out. <laughs> That's the stuff, my boy. Now lay it on top of the soapbox, and we'll saw it into lengths. C can I saw, Unc? Perhaps after I've shown you how. Oh, for coin's sake. I've been sawing all my life. Well, there's a right way and a wrong way to do everything, my boy. You might as well start by learning the right way. Okay. First, you observe. I take the ruler, and I measure it all very carefully, exactly three feet, six inches. Then... Uh, Unc. What? The ruler. Wrong end. Oh, <laughs> you don't mark these very clearly, my boy. There. Now, the saw. Here you are. Thank you. There. Now about saws. There are two kinds of saws. The cross cut and uh, uh, the other uh, kind. Rip. What? Where? Rip saw. That's the other kind. Oh, very good. Rip. <laughs> you know how to tell them apart? No. How? Well, uh, takes experience. All these things call for experience. Oh, what kind is this? Huh? The saw. Is it a cross cut or a rip saw? Well, sort of in between. <laughs> now observe the way I hold it, Leroy. Lightly yet firmly. Being careful at all times not to drop it or bang it against anything. Teeth are very delicate, you know. I know. Now will you take your piece of wood so? You place it on the box. And you put your knee on top of it to steady it. Oh. Are you watching? I'm watching. Next, I raise the saw, take careful aim, and start in with a smooth, even stroke. You hit a nail, Unc. Yeah, Don Ford, that's tar of the trouble with it. That's bad for the saw. You don't have to tell me, Leroy. Only it wasn't my fault, but I'll tell you. We'll make the doghouse three feet five inches. That way we'll miss the nails. Yeah, but there's a knot. A knot? All right. Three feet four, then we'll miss the knot. Well, we may have to take a couple of inches off the dog, but let her rip. Uh. 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 Don Wood. You know what, Unc? What? I figure... We're going to need about 48 pieces like this. 48? Well, there's the bottom, two sides, two ends, and two pieces for the roof. Gee, all of this for a dog.
Hey, Unc. Unc, your coat. Never talk to a man when he's sawing, Leroy. But your, but your coat, you're sawing it. Oh, <laughs> confounded thing. <laughs> Stand back, Leroy. <coughs> Good work, Unc. That makes 17. Only 31 to go. 31? Oh, uh, Mr. Gildersleeve. Down here, Bertie. Oh, my goodness. You been down here all afternoon? Never talk to a man when he's sawing, Bertie. Don't be impudent, Leroy. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Gildersleeve. Mrs. Ransom's on the phone. Oh, Mrs. Ransom? Yes, sir. She wants to know. Could you come over to her house for a little tea? Could I? <laughs> oh, Unc. <laughs> Tell her here I come, Bertie. But, Unc, what about the dog house? Well, you get the idea now, Leroy. I'll leave the finishing touches to you. Finishing touches? We haven't even started. I don't know how to go on. I'll tell you what to do. You find a nice soapbox and cut a hole in one end for the door. <laughs> tell her I'll be right there, Bertie. Gosh, what a character. How do you like your tea, Throgmorton? Strong or weak? Well, I'm not much of a tea hound, to tell the truth. I like it anyway. Oh, you like it strong, probably, because you are so strong. <laughs> I suppose you like it weak. <laughs> oh, silly. Tell me, what are you doing this evening? Do you have any plans? Plans? Not a thing. Oh, good. You'll stay to supper then. Oh, will I? Leela, what's up? Come on, tell me. Oh, Shrub Morton, you are so impetuous. All right, I'll sit over here then. Now, tell me. Well, drink your tea first. You know, Shrub Morton, I've had a feeling that you've been a little put out with me lately. Put out? I don't know where you got that. Well, it's true. I know it is. Tell me, is it because of Dr. Hargrave? Why should I be put out about him? He means nothing to me, one way or the other. Well, I thought it was because of that party on New Year's Eve and because I've been seeing so much of him lately. Have you? This tea is good. Hmm, I'm glad. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Tell me now, now that you've been to him, don't you agree that he's wonderful? Who's wonderful? Dr. Hargrave. Oh, I don't see what's so wonderful about him. He's just a doctor. Oh, but I think that all doctors are wonderful. Well, I never hear you rave about Dr. Pettibone. Of course, Pettibone doesn't kiss your hand. Oh, Shrug Morton. If you're implying that Dr. Hargrave has made advances to me, you are mistaken. Oh, gracious. He's much too busy to have any interest in poor little me. All he cares about is science. Huh? Uh-huh. That's all any real doctor cares about, science. Ooh, I love science. Huh? I think he looks a little like Walter Pigeon, don't you? Who's Walter Pigeon? You mean to tell me that you've never seen Walter Pigeon in the movies? Well, I can't tell one movie actor from another. Oh, I saw him in The Life of Madame Curie last week, and he was wonderful, even with a beard. Oh, and so was Greer Garson. Huh? Well, all she did was stand at his side day and night and be a help to him and bring him little things to eat. And that's all I'd ask. What? Just to be allowed to stand at his side and feel that I was contributing my little bit to science. Are you talking about Walter Pigeon or Dr. Hargrave? Frog Martin, you're laughing at no, me. No, I'm not, only. Well, he doesn't laugh at me. He told me to take him along with him on a case sometime. Leela, if you got me over here just to tell me how wonderful Dr. Hargrave is. Well, I'm sorry, Frog Martin. I know you're jealous, and I shouldn't go on like that. I'm not 
not jealous just because I'm not a doctor. Gosh, you'd think doctors were the only people who are wonderful. Oh, we can't all be doctors, Throgmorton. I know that. It takes all kinds. Thank you. Now you are a businessman, and that's wonderful, too. Well. Oh, it is. You understand about financial things and all. Things that make my po hate swim. Matter of training, that's all. Oh, no, it's more than that. It takes genius. Ooh, well, of course, if you want to call it that. Oh, I just admire anyone showing that they can add and subtract and everything. I bet Hargrave can't do it. I bet Walter Pigeon can't either. Mm. Well, that's why I asked you over this evening, Chuck Morton. What? Why? Well, I, I, I thought we'd be here together and we could just... Oh, well, you see, I got my income tax this morning and I declare I can't make head or tail of it. So that's it, Leela. Oh, but I'd stay by your side every minute, Throgmorton, and bring you little things to eat. Oh, please. Pretty please. Oh, by George, I wish I'd stuck the stinky in the doghouse. The great Gildersleeve will be with us again in just a few seconds. During the current drive for victory, we're all going to need extra energy to get the job done. And that's why it's so important to see that the family diet includes a plentiful supply of well-balanced, nourishing foods. Foods that really taste good, like parquet, the famous bread for bread made by Kraft. Parquet has a delicate, appetizing flavor that really satisfies. It steps up your family nutrition program because it makes the family want to eat more bread and other foods that contribute to growing health and strength. And for energy, parquet margarine is one of the very best energy foods you can serve. And remember, every pound contains at least 9,000 units of important vitamin A. So for flavor, for good nutrition, and for economy, be sure to ask your dealer for parquet. P-A-R-K-A-Y, parquet margarine, made by Kraft. Now, let's get back to the great Gildersleeve. Two hours have passed, but he's right where we left him, trapped by the widow Ransom's silken snare and floundering around in her income tax. Well, let's see here. Business or profession, fill in the schedule, C2. Farmers keeping notebooks or accounts. Well, she's not a farmer, that much I know, and she's not in the armed forces. Trap Morton, supper. Ooh, thank you. Goodness. Oh, don't get up, darling. I'm bringing it to you on a tray. Oh? What you got? Well, it's just a sandwich and a glass of milk. Is that what Walter Pigeon gets? Oh, silly. I thought as long as we'd had tea, you wouldn't be wanting much. And this way, you won't have to interrupt your work. Oh, that's great. How are you coming? Oh, I can see that you're doing just fine. I haven't even started yet, Leela. If you want me to help you with this thing, you'll have to give me the necessary information. Oh, I'll be glad to, Throgmorton, if it's not too personal. <laughs> to begin with, Leela, have you had any net gain or loss from the sale or exchange of property other than capital assets? Gracious, how should I know? I'd have to ask Judge Hooker. Well, why don't you? Why don't you get him to make out the whole income tax? He's your lawyer. I know. But I've asked the judge to help me with so many things lately. I just couldn't ask him to do more without charging me. <laughs> He'd be glad to do it. You really think so? He'd be delighted. <laughs> Let me call him up and get him right over here. Oh, I couldn't ask him, Throgmorton. <laughs> and I will. Where's the telephone? Right over there. Hello, Judge. How'd you guess? Listen, you old son of a gun. Where have you been keeping yourself lately? I haven't seen you in a week. Is that a way to treat your friends? Oh, me too. Say, Judge, guess where I'm voting you from? Leela's, yes, he is. We're having some more darn fun. 
But I got to thinking about you, Judge, and Leela said, gee, I wish Horus was here, and I said to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to call Judge up and see if he can come over. How about it, Judge? Great. Hurry now. Oh, Judge, be sure to bring your glasses. <laughs> You see, just leave it to your Uncle Throckmorton. He'll be right over. That can't be him. Oh, excuse me. Why, it's Mr. Peavy. Come in. Peavy! Good evening, Mrs. Ransom. Oh, well. Hello, Mr. Gildersleeve. Won't you take off your coat? Oh, no, I won't stay, Mrs. Ransom. I was on my way home to supper, and I just dropped by to leave this. Kleenex? Throckmorton, it's a box of Kleenex. Kleenex? Oh, you don't know how hard it is to get with a worn all. Oh, Mr. Peavy, you're a lamb. Oh, I declare... I could just kiss you. <laughs> oh, no. I couldn't do that. As a matter of fact, I had it put away for you under the counter. Then I went away for a few days. I heard you had the flu, Peavy. How are you feeling? Oh, just fine, Mr. Gildersleeve. Fit as a fiddle. Oh, fit as a fiddle and ready for love, huh? Well, now, <laughs> I hope I'm not interrupting anything here. Oh, no, Peavy, stick around. We weren't doing anything. Just my income tax. No rush about that. You say you were out of town for a few days? Yes. Mrs. Peavy and I had to go down to Belleville. Oh, great. Have a good time. Well, we were there on a rather sad errand. Oh. My mother-in-law, Mrs. Peavy's mother. Oh, that's too bad. Well, I guess we all have to go sometime. Well, perhaps it was all for the best. Well, I raised that point. But Mrs. Peavy, she couldn't seem to see it my way. Of course, she was upset. Oh, of course. But it was a nice service. Dr. Kaltenmeyer spoke a few words, and we saw a lot of people we hadn't seen. Everything was very nice. Hmm, and that's always such a comfort, I think. Yes. You know, the old lady lived with us for a good many years before she went to Billville to live with her son. I guess it won't seem like home without her. Well, now, I... <laughs> I guess I'd better be getting along home. Don't rush off, Peavy. Oh, no, don't. We're not doing anything. Just trying to finish my income tax. Yes, income tax. Have you looked at the thing yet, Peavy? Mr. Gildersleeve, I looked at it this morning. And there's one thing I wish someone would tell me. Oh, what's that? Are they kidding? Thank heaven, must be Hooker. I'll go. Well, hello, Judge. Come on in. Thank you, Gildy. Ah, by golly, I'm glad you called me up. I'm just in the mood for a little diversion. Oh, well, you came to the right place, Judge. Here, let me have your coat. Thank you. There's so plenty of diversion. <laughs> Charming hostess. Indeed she is. Where is Leela? In the other room. Plenty of diversion, Judge. And a chance to do a New Year's good deed, too. Hmm? Good deed? Uh-huh. Say, Horace, let's help Leela with her income tax. Gildersleeve, you're a dirty dog. <laughs> Why, Horace, the poor little girl is desperate. Are you going to let her think you're unwilling to help? Well, I'm not unwilling. I, I just don't like to be invited to people's houses under false pretenses. Oh, Horace, now come on, be a sport. We'll have it done in no time. Well, I guess you haven't seen the new tax form. Well, Leela, here's Horace. Many hands make like work, you know. Oh, Horace, you're an angel to help me. Glad to do it for you, Leela. Glad to do it. <laughs> now, uh, 
Uh, you got your checkbook here, your deposit slips? Trump Morton, I knew he'd think of something practical right away. Here they are, Judge. Fine. Now, these represent all the money you received during the year, do they not? Well, practically. All my big checks are deposited. Only once in a while I get a little bitty dividend, and I just cash that. Oh, this is going to be worse than I thought. Now, let me see the list of securities. I'll write down all the dividends, whether you got them or not. Here's the list. <laughs> Remember? You made it out for me yourself. Yeah, mm -hmm. I remember. Uh, now let's see. One share of Happy Valley Light and Power, five dollars. One share of Fisdale Improvement Company, five dollars. One share of... Leela, let's go to the other room and let the judge concentrate. But he might want to ask some questions. No, he's got all the stuff right there. Come on. Oh, Shrug Morton, I don't feel right sneaking off like this while the judge is working. We weren't helping him any. When there's something I can do to help, I'll do it. Come on, let's sit by the fire. No, I, I don't think we'd better somehow. Oh? Oh, I've got a great idea. Let's dance. Oh, no. The radio would disturb the judge. We won't use the radio. I'll just sing softly in your little ear. <laughs> Well, just for a minute. All right. Why do I love you? Why do you love me? La, 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 la. Oh, you do dance nicely, Throgmorton. Now, now, let's just dance, shall we? Let's go downtown someplace and dance, Leela, just for a little while. The judge will never notice we've gone. Why, Throgmorton, what a disloyal idea. You got Horace over here to help you. Yeah, and he's being a big help. <laughs> Listen, Leela. Now, Throgmorton, stop. Hey, Gildersleeve, what's going on? <laughs> we were just dancing, Judge. Dancing? I don't see any orchestra. <laughs> well, Throgmorton was singing for the music. Uh, uh. Well, that sounds more like what I came over for. Gildersleeve, suppose you go and check my edition while I tread a few measures. Judge, I'll take your edition on trust. I'd feel much better if you'd check it, Throckmorton. Oh, this is no fair, you old goat. Leela, may I have the pleasure of this dance? Oh, I'd be delighted, Judge. All right. Play, orchestra, play. Put on your old gray bonnet with the blue ribbons on it While I put old Dobbin to the shade For we're off to Dover through the fields of clover On our golden wedding day oh, My goodness, Horace, you certainly dance vigorously Phew. Thank you, Leela. You're a very good dancer yourself. Oh, thank you. You're looking very handsome, too. Now, Judge... Say, why don't you and I go down to Peavy's and get a soda? Throckmorton will never notice. Well, Horace Hooker, I thought you came over here to help me. Oh, well, I did. But Gildy's doing so well, I thought, oh, come on. Just take us a few minutes. Judge, you ought to be ashamed. Is this man annoying you, madam? <laughs> well, are you all through with the addition, Throgmorton? Yeah, and the judge made a mistake, too. I don't believe it. Where is it? That's for you to find out. It's there. Come on, Leela. It's my dance. No, you boys are being ridiculous, both of you. Let's go and finish up my whole little income tax, and then we can all have fun. But Leela, it's my turn. Now you had the first turn, and now we're all even. Oh, come on, Throgmorton, let's finish up. Oh, well, come on, Judge. All right. Now, let's see, Leela. Did you make any contributions during the year 1943? Well, I put 50 cents in the plate every Sunday. Oh, mercy, who can that be? Excuse me, Horace, Throgmorton. 
All right, Judge, contributions is easy, but what about net capital gains? Let me see you explain that if you're so smart. Ah, good evening, Mrs. Ransom. Why, Dr. Hargrave, oh, what a surprise. Well, I warned you I'd need your help on a case sometime. Would you like to be an angel of mercy for a little while? Oh, I surely would, Doctor, only I... I've got a call about 20 miles out in the country. Some farmer's broken his leg. But it's a nice moonlight night, and my tank is full of gas. Oh, how exciting. How exciting. Uh, the broken leg, I mean. Well, are you game? Well, I'll tell you. I've got two income tax men here working on my return. Oh, and I don't... we'll be back in two hours, I promise. Hello? What is it, Leela? Oh, Strug Morton, I... Oh, hello there, Gildersleeve. And Judge Hooker. Good evening. Hello, Hargrave. What do you want, you two dollars? <laughs> no. I, I've got an emergency case I've got to see, Gildersleeve. And Mrs. Ransom has very kindly consented to go along as my mm, anesthetist. Oh, Dr. Hargrave. Oh. Now, look here, Leela. Leela, this isn't fair. It's only 20 miles. 20 miles? Where's my coat? Is this it? Oh, yes, yes, thank you. Now, you boys keep working, you hear? And I'll be back in an hour. Leela! Leela! Goodbye! Goodbye! Lee! I'll be doggone. What's he got that we haven't got? Science! That's women for you! Leroy, it's half past eight. Bedtime, my boy. Why, so it is, Unc. I've been working so hard, I didn't notice. Well, doing your homework? Oh, no, I finished that Saturday. Oh? I've been cleaning up the cellar. Well, well. Good night, Uncle Mort. <gasps> I wonder what's come over him. Good night, everybody. <laughs> This is Ken Carpenter speaking for the Kraft Cheese Company, inviting you to listen in next week for the further adventures of the Great Gildersleeve. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Presents Hollywood. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, brings you the Lux Radio Theater. Is there life on other planets? In tonight's play, we'll tell you of a possible momentous event in our future the arrival on this planet of a man from outer space. Now, sit back. And hear what happens on the day the Earth stood still. It was a pleasant day, spring day, an ideal day for a walk in the park, a day to push the baby buggy and be glad you were alive. There had been at least 20 such sparkling days that spring, and perhaps a billion or more of them since the Earth began, and nothing had ever happened to spoil them but a few small fires, a slight head cold in the evening or a rain squall. But this spring day, in the middle of the marvelous 20th century, was different. It was the most different day that had happened to mankind since the first Christmas. 
The thing was noticed in Hong Kong first on the British radar. But that's impossible! That thing must be doing about 4,000! That can't be aircraft, sir! Must be a buzz bomb! Better give it an alarm, though! Keep it steady! Though, maybe faulty equipment! If the British radar in Hong Kong was faulty, so was the radar all over the Orient, and Asia, and Europe, and so were the announcers on the radio. This is Moskva. This is Radio Luxembourg. This is Cal Kapar, India. The American radar screen could quickly confirm the fact that there was nothing wrong with the British radar, and that there was something very gravely wrong 40 miles out in space, far above the Earth. Lieutenant Ferris to Baker. Ferris to Baker. I have an object at 200,000 feet. 4000 miles an hour. And then it was here. Incredibly, it was here, burning down through the sky over Washington, D.C., hovering over the mall, descending. They're here. They've come. They're here. They're here. Not a sound, stillness. Not a move from the cordon of tanks and armored cars and troops in full battle dress. And not a sound or gesture from the monstrous domed disc resting on the grass. The ship designed for travel outside the Earth's atmosphere landed in Washington today at 3.47 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We still don't know where it came from. The ship is now resting exactly where it landed two hours ago. So far, there's no sign of life from inside the ship. Beyond the cordon of troops, tanks, and artillery is a huge crowd of curiosity seekers. Every eye, every weapon is trained on the ship. The atmosphere is one of terrific tension rather than fear. It's been that way for just a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, I think something's happening. The spaceship is opening up. Someone is coming out. A wedge is opened in the smooth, unbroken metal skin of the spaceship. A ramp slithers out on the grass. Against an eerie glow of unearthly light from inside the spaceship stands the spaceman. He is a man entirely like ourselves. He wears a close-fitting suit like a deep-sea diver's armor, but of alien material. A spherical helmet entirely conceals his head. He holds up his hand. He is going to speak. We have come to visit you in peace and with good will. Receive me as a friend. Here he comes, Ben. Watch it. Keep that BAR trained on him. He's going for something in his tunic, sir. Quiet. It's a ray gun or something. I'm going to shoot. No, no, wait. <laughs> You fool! He's down! Hold back that crowd! Everybody, back! <sighs> Your wound doesn't look too bad. I'm sorry, but you shouldn't have gone for that ray gun. It was not a weapon. He understands us. It was a gift for your president. With it, you might have studied life on other planets. What's bothering the crowd, Lieutenant? Tell them to... Oh, no. No! Oh, no! A nightmare stands on the ramp leading out of the spaceship. A mechanical giant, monstrous, all metal and menace, with a visor in his helmet lifting slowly, revealing a dreadful light, boiling within that metal head. And suddenly out of that incandescence comes a narrow ray. Rifles, tanks, artillery glow with that terrible incandescence and they become vapor in a mush of molten steel. And in the deathly silence that follows, the robot strides down the ramp. The Avenger. From where? Gort. Debro, Alasco. He won't hurt you now. Let's get you to a hospital.
Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. The doctors tell me your wound is not serious. No, it amazes them that it's almost healed already. <laughs> I'm very glad. It should serve as an indication of our powers. My name is Harley, secretary to the president. I've been told you speak our language fluently, that your name is Mr. Klaatu. Just Klaatu. The president asked me to convey our deepest apologies for what has happened. Sit down, Mr. Harley. <clears throat> I'm sure I don't have to point out that your arrival was uh, something of a surprise. Um, have you been traveling long? About five months, your months. You must have come a long way. About 250 million of your miles. Uh, naturally, we're very curious to know where you come from. From another planet. Let's just say that we're neighbors. <laughs> neighbors. It's rather hard for us to think of another planet as a neighbor. I'm afraid in the present situation you'll have to learn to think that way. The present situation? I mean, the reasons for my coming. Would you care to talk about it? No, uh, not with you alone. Perhaps you'd rather discuss it personally with the president. I want to meet with the representatives from all the nations of the earth. <laughs> I'm afraid that would be a little awkward. Why? In view of the tensions and suspicions <clears throat> in our world today, such a meeting would be impossible. Mr. Harley, my mission here concerns the existence of every last creature who lives on Earth. It must not be complicated by the childish jealousies, intrigue, suspicions of your planet. Our problems are very complex. You mustn't judge us too harshly. I'm impatient with stupidity. My people have learned to live without it. The President, of course, will do uh, uh, his best to bring about the meeting you desire. It will be quite useless, however. Um, I wish it were otherwise. I'm very sorry, Mr. Klaatu. Wait. Uh, before making any grave decisions, I think I should get out among your people and become familiar with the basis for these strange, unreasoning attitudes. <laughs> our, our military people insist that you do not attempt to leave the hospital. The door will be locked. I'm sure you understand. Good day, Mr. Klaatu. The door will be locked. Will it now? Klaatu escaped. Nor could the embarrassing news of his disappearance long be suppressed. It was read about in the papers and described in excited tones over the radio. The authorities at Walter Reed Hospital still refuse to comment on how he managed to escape, except to say he broke into a hospital locker and stole clothing belonging to a staff doctor. While the government does not minimize the crisis, it urges people all over the world to remain calm and further advises that the facilities of all federal agencies are being brought to bear. Calm, he says. You're kidding. Now, this was the latest and the only news, and among the countless millions of listeners were two women and a boy in an ordinary home on an ordinary street in Washington, Mrs. Crockett's rooming house. There was Mrs. Crockett and Helen Benson and little Bobby Benson. We are warned, however, this is no ordinary manhunt, and we may be up against powers that are beyond our control or understanding, and that we... Oh, I just can't stand any more of this. Oh, I wanted to hear more, Mrs. Crockett. It's exciting, isn't it, Mother? Hush, Bobby. Exciting? It's enough to drive a person... Oh, who are you? I'm sorry. I saw your sign outside and the door was open. My name is Carpenter. Yes? I'm looking for a room. Oh, oh yes. I do have a nice room. Are, are you a G-man? No, I'm afraid I'm not. I bet he is, Mom. I bet he's looking for that spaceman. I think we've all been hearing too much about spacemen, Mr. Carpenter. This is Mrs. Benson, Mr. Carpenter. How do you do? And this is little Bobby, my youngest guest. Hi. I'm Mrs. Crockett. 
You're a long way from home, aren't you, Mr. Carpenter? How did you know? <laughs> I can tell an accent every time. This way, please, Mr. Carpenter. And so, this Sunday morning, we ask the question that has been plaguing the entire world for two days now. Where is the creature and what is he up to? Eat your cereal, Bobby. Oh, Mom, I'm almost full as it is. Bobby. Okay, Mr. Carpenter. I'm sorry, Mrs. Crockett. Please go on reading. Hmm, let's see. Creature and what is he up to? Ah, if he could build a spaceship that can fly to Earth, and a robot that can destroy our tanks and guns, what other terrors can he unleash at will? What a man! Obviously, we must track down the monster and destroy him before he destroys us. Correct. Then why don't they do it? The spaceman, or whatever he is, we automatically assume he's a menace. Maybe he isn't, after all. Well, then, where is he, Mrs. Benson? What is he up to? Maybe he's afraid. Uh, he's afraid? Well, after all, he was shot the minute he landed here. I was just wondering what I'd do. Perhaps before deciding on a course of action, you'd want to know more about the people here. Nothing strange about Washington. A person from another <clears throat> planet might disagree with you. Oh! <clears throat> it's all right, Mrs. Crockett. That's Mr. Stevens calling for me. I'll go to the door. That awful robot standing there like an ugly iron statue. It gives me the shivers. Morning, Tom. Good morning, Helen. Hey, uh, can anyone see us now? No. <laughs> mm. Okay, so all right, we're all set. I picked up some sandwiches. I put gas in the car. The radio's busted so we can forget about this spaceman for a day, okay? I'm sorry. I haven't been able to arrange for anyone to stay with Bobby. Mrs. Crockett's going out, and uh, I don't suppose we could take him with us. Uh, well, I guess we could. Oh, just today. Mrs. Crockett has plans, and I don't know who else to ask. I haven't any plans. Oh, Mr. Carpenter. I'd be glad to spend the day with Bobby, if you'd let me. That'd be great. Thank you. Well, it's very nice of you to offer. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Carpenter. This is Tom Stevens. Hello. How do you do? Bobby and I had a fine time yesterday afternoon. I thought he might show me around the city today. Well, I... <laughs> Please, I'd enjoy it. And, and this is where my father is buried. Robert Benson, Virginia, 1st Lieutenant, 45th Infantry, April 10th, 1916, January 29th, 1944. Your father was very young, wasn't he, Bobby? Uh, he was killed at, at Anzio. Did, did all these people here die in wars? Oh, most of them. Didn't you ever hear of Arlington Cemetery? I'm afraid not. You don't seem to know much about anything, Mr. Carpenter. I've been far away, Bobby. Well, don't they have places like this where you've been? Not like this one. You see, they don't have any wars. Let's walk. All right. What would you like to do now? Go to the movie. All right. No fooling? No fooling. Uh, do you have to have money to go there? Well, I've got $2. I'll treat you, OK? No, I want to take you. Look, do you think they'd accept these? Gee, what are they, diamonds? Well, in some places, these are what people use for money. They're easy to carry, and they don't wear out. I'll bet they're worth a million dollars. Would you give me your two dollars for two of these? Oh, sure, okay. There you are. Uh, let's not say anything to Mom about this, all right? Why not? Well, she doesn't like me to take advantage of people. Hey, before we go to the movies, would you like to see the Abraham Lincoln Memorial? Thank you. Yes, I would. Well, this is it. That's the Gettysburg speech up there. That this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, 
and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Those are great words. Well, that's some statue. That's the kind of man I'd like to talk to. Bobby, who is the greatest man in America today? Gee, I, I, I don't know. The spaceman, I guess. I was speaking of Earth people. Oh, I, I, I don't know. The president. I mean the greatest philosopher, the greatest thinker, scholar. Oh, well, that's Professor Barnhart, I guess. Yes, Professor Barnhart. Oh, he's the greatest scientist in the world. He lives right here in Washington, right near where my mother works. Where is that? Department of Commerce. He's a secretary. Why? I have an idea, Bobby. Let's go see Professor Barnhart. W what for? You just said he's the greatest man in America. <laughs> You're kidding, aren't you? Wouldn't you like to meet him? Well, sure I would. Oh, go on. I bet you'd be scared. Maybe we can scare him more than he can scare us. <laughs> I like you, Mr. Carpenter. You're a real screwball. Gee, maybe the professor isn't home. Let's take a look through that window. I'll bet this is where he works. Look in there. Books all over, blackboards full of stuff. Ah, oh, door's locked, too. Is it? Oh, I know. It isn't, Bobby. Well, that's funny. We'll go in and wait for him. I'm sure he won't mind. Gee, just think, all the brains that goes on in here? What's all that stuff on the blackboard? Uh, <laughs> it's a problem in celestial mechanics. What's the matter? He'll never get the answer that way. Let's see. We hey, it's, 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 don't erase, don't touch. This is right. Check. Correct. That's correct. Ah, here's where he gets off the track. Well, we'll just fix that. So and so. Hmm. You must be an arithmetic teacher. Differentiate the equation. There. Who are you? Uh-oh. How dare you come in like this? How dare you write on that blackboard? Do you realize the professor's been working on that problem for weeks? He'll solve it in no time now. What do you want? We came to see Professor Barnhart. Well, he's not here, and he won't be back until evening. I think you had better leave. Will you tell him that Mr. Carpenter was here, 1615 M Street Northwest? I think he'll want to talk to me. Indeed. Thank you. Oh, it may have entered your mind to erase what I've written on the blackboard. It certainly has. I wouldn't do that. The professor needs it very badly. Come on, Bobby. Carpenter, 1615 M Street Northwest. Carpenter, M Street. Operator, give me the police. And now, act two of The Day the Earth Stood Still. It is early evening of the same day. Tom Stevens and Helen Benson drive up to the boarding house after their picnic, quite unaware of the dark squad car parked at the curb a few feet ahead. Well, here we are. Thank you, Tom. I had a wonderful day. Yeah, but you still haven't answered my question. Oh, you know how I feel, Tom. But I still want time to think it over. Yeah, but if I could only tell the boss I was getting married and acquiring two dependents... You're a good salesman. A uh, good salesman wouldn't give you time to think about it. Good night. Uh, didn't you forget something? Mm. Mm. Now good night. <laughs> good night. Oh, Mr. Carpenter. Hi, Mom. Hello, darling. Uh, Mrs. Benson, this is Mr. Brady. How do you do? 
How do you do? Mr. Brady's a government agent. Oh? Did you have a nice day, Bobby? We had a swell time, didn't we, Mr. Carpenter? Yes, we did. We went to the movies and had a banana split and went to see Daddy at the cemetery. Oh, I don't know how to thank you, Mr. Carpenter. I enjoyed every minute of it. We better get going. Yes. Good night, Bobby. Good night. I'll tell you the rest of that story tomorrow, Bobby. Good night, Mrs. Benson. Good night. Nice meeting you, Mrs. Benson. Thank you. Why did Mr. Carpenter have to go with Mr. Brady? I don't know. Maybe it was a mistake. Upstairs with you. Yeah, we sure had fun today. We went all over Washington and went to see Professor Barnhart. Professor Barnhart? Oh, sure. Barnhart? Up to bed now, pronto. Is this the man you wanted to see, Professor Barnhart? Oh, thank you, Mr. Brady. If I may speak to Mr. Carpenter alone, please. I'll wait outside, Professor. You are Mr. Carpenter? Yes, Professor. Who wrote those equations on my blackboard? My clumsy way of introducing myself. Uh, forgive the manner in which you were picked up. Uh, Hilda called the police before I saw your annotations on the board. I appreciate your need for security, Professor. I, I have not quite fathomed the problem, even with your remarkable assistance, Mr. Carpenter. Well, let's look at it, sir. All you have to do now is substitute this expression at this point. Yes, that will reproduce the first order term, but what about the effect of the other terms? Negligible. With variation of parameters, this is the answer. How can you be so sure? Have you tested this theory? I find it works well enough for me to get from one planet to another. Clatu! I spent two days at your Walter Reed Hospital. I was interviewed... I need no proof. The blackboard is proof. If you're not interested, or if you intend to turn me over to the Army, we needn't waste any more time. Are you kidding? <coughs> interested? Uh, will you excuse me for a moment, please? Mr. Brady, you may go now. Please thank General Cutler and tell him, tell him that I know this gentleman. So much for that, Clatu. Now, please sit down. You have faith, Professor. Faith and curiosity. Do sit down. I have several thousand questions to ask you. I would like to explain my mission here. That is my first question. It was my hope to discuss this officially with all the nations of the world. I was not allowed the opportunity. Now, we know from scientific observation that your planet has discovered a rudimentary kind of atomic energy. We also know that you're experimenting with rockets. Yes, that is true. What exactly is the nature of your mission? To warn you that your planet faces danger. What I have to say must be said to all concerned. I come to you as a last resort. Must I take drastic action in order to get a hearing? What sort of action do you mean? Violent action. Perhaps leveling the island of Manhattan, or toppling the rock of Gibraltar into the sea. Well? Would you, for example, be willing to meet with a group of scientists I'm calling together? We're having our first meeting tomorrow night. Perhaps you could explain your mission to them, and they, in turn, could present it to their various peoples. That is what I came to see you about. One thing, Khatu. Suppose this group should reject your proposals. What is the alternative? There is no alternative, Professor. In such a case, the planet Earth would have to be eliminated. Such power exists? I assure you, such power exists. The scientists who are attending these meetings have come here from all over the world. This power you speak of, they must be made to realize that it exists. Now, you mentioned a demonstration of force. Yes. Something that would affect the entire planet? That can be arranged. Perhaps a little demonstration. Something dramatic, but not destructive. It's quite an interesting problem. Would tomorrow be all right? If you say so. Say about noon? Then...
tomorrow at noon. Good. Going out tonight, Mrs. Benson? Oh. oh, it's you, Mr. Carpenter. I'm afraid I startled you. Yes, I'm going out. Mr. Stevens is calling for me. Everyone seems so, so... Jittery is the word. Bobby's the only person I know who isn't jittery. He's a fine boy, Mrs. Benson. Naturally, I think so. Warm, friendly, intelligent. He's the only real friend I've made since I've been here. Mr. Carpenter, this is none of my business, but why did that detective come here last night, that Mr. Brady? Bobby and I tried to see Professor Barnhart in the afternoon, but he wasn't in. Apparently, they thought I was looking for secrets of some kind. Oh, that must be Tom now. <clears throat> oh, Mr. Stevens, do come in. Helen is in the sitting room. Alert. Mrs. Crockett, she's got a romantic mind. Oh, hello there, Helen. Not a minute to spare. Are you ready? Oh, hello, Carpenter. Come on, Helen, the picture starts at 8.50 on the dot. I'll be ready in a minute. I was just talking to Mr. Carpenter. Oh, I hope Mr. Carpenter won't think I'm intruding. Excuse me, I was just going up to my room. Good night. Good night, Mr. Carpenter. Have a good time, both of you. Thank you. Tom, that was awful. Oh, sorry. I guess I'm just tired of hearing about Mr. Carpenter, Mr. Carpenter. Shh. I don't like the way he's attached himself to you and Bobby. After all, what do you know about him? Very little, it's true. Well, let's not stand and talk about it anymore. I'll go up and get my things. Gee, Mr. Carpenter, thanks a lot for helping me with my homework. That's all there is to it, Bobby, my boy. All you have to remember is first find the common denominator, then subtract. I got you. Thanks, Mr. Carpenter. I'm leaving with Tom, Bobby. Um, you'll go to bed on time now, won't you? I'll su say good night again, Mrs. Carpenter. Mr. Carpenter? Yes? Oh, nothing. Good night. Good night. Good night, Bobby. Bobby, I think it would be better if you didn't see quite so much of Mr. Carpenter. Well, gee, why, Mom? He's swell. I like him. And he's awful good at arithmetic. He even helped Professor Barnhart. I'm sure he's a very nice man. I just think he might prefer to be left alone. Now go to bed, darling. Why would he want to be left alone? Don't forget to brush your teeth. Come in. Bobby, do you have a flashlight I might borrow for tonight? Oh, sure, Mr. Carpenter. It's a real Boy Scout one. Thank you, Bobby. Why do you want it? The light in my room went out. See you tomorrow. Better get to bed now. Gee, I wonder if the batteries are any good. Uh, Mr. Carpenter? Bobby went to the door and opened it, and what he saw down the hallway puzzled him. Mr. Carpenter's door was ajar, and light was pouring out of his room. Hmm, funny. He said his light was out. And then Mr. Carpenter came out carrying the flashlight and stealing down the steps like a thief. This was peculiar, but this was adventure. Bobby followed Mr. Carpenter, and what he saw, it couldn't have been a dream. It was too real. But it couldn't have been true either. It, it was too deliciously frightful. Dream or not, it was filled with darkness, stung by staccato flashes from a genuine Boy Scout flashlight. Flashes that activated a giant robot into knocking out his guards so that Mr. Carpenter from the boarding house could get into the shed the army had built around the spaceship. And dream or not, Bobby saw this Mr. Carpenter go in the spaceship. And then a wave of sheer terror swept over Bobby at last, and he turned and he ran wildly away, the way little boys always run in nightmares, trying so hard and moving so slowly and all the time falling down. It was awful, but it was swell. 
When his mother came home around midnight, Bobby was curled up on the sofa. Instantly, he jumped up and ran to her and to Tom Stevens as they came into the hallway. Mom, Mom, listen! Bobby, what are you doing down here at this hour fully dressed? Oh, hello, Mr. Stevens. Mom, I had to tell you. <sighs> tell me what? What's the matter, Bobby? Well, I followed Mr. Carpenter tonight, right after you left. And, and gee, where do you think he went? Right into the spaceship. <laughs> now, Bobby, just one minute. Honest, Mom, I saw him. They got a shed built around the spaceship so nobody can get to it. But Mr. Carpenter flashed a signal to that Iron Man up there. And what do you think? Bobby, have you been dreaming again? Yeah, why, sure. No, Mom, honest, I haven't. I promise you, I saw it. And where did you see all of this? Well, I'm telling you, on the lawn down at the mall, in that place where the soldiers are all out in front. Oh? And where were the soldiers all this time? Well, that robot fella grabbed him and, and knocked him out. Oh, Bobby. Yeah, and then Mr. Carpenter walked into the shed, and the spaceship opened up, and he walked right inside, and it closed again. Gee, I like Mr. Carpenter, but I'm scared, Mom. <laughs> oh, darling, it was just a bad dream. We'll prove it to you. Tom, will you see if Mr. Carpenter's still up? Ask him to come down here for a minute. Helen. Yes, Tom? Helen, he's not up there. But look what I found on the carpet. It can't be a diamond, can it? I don't know. It's much too big. But it looks real to me. Oh, Mr. Carpenter's got lots of them. He gave a couple of them to me. Here. He gave you these? Well, not exactly. I gave him $2. I don't know, but, but this whole thing, it just doesn't make any sense at all. Now look, Helen, do you think it's safe for you to stay here? There's a strong lock on my door, and Bobby's going to sleep in my room tonight. Okay. Upstairs, nightmare boy. It wasn't a nightmare. Bobby? Yeah, Mom? Bobby, your shoes are soaking wet. Yeah, grass on the mall was kind of wet. Good night, or... Oh, Tom, I wonder... Plateau had promised what Professor Barnhart termed a little demonstration. Promised it for the following day at noon. It is now two minutes to 12. In the Department of Commerce building, Helen Benson has left her office on her way to lunch. She stands in the corridor waiting for an elevator. Mrs. Benson? Mr. Carpenter, what are you doing here? I came to see you. Oh, well, I was just going to lunch. What is it? I saw Bobby this morning before he went to school. Yes? I want to know what he told you. Oh, oh, Bobby has such an active imagination. Did you believe what he told you? Oh, really, Mr. Carpenter, this is where I work, and I only have a short time for lunch today, if you'll excuse me. I'll go down with you. If you like. The service elevator's open. You'll have to press the button, Mr. Carpenter. Oh, yes. It was just five seconds before noon of that fateful day when Helen Benson and Mr. Carpenter stepped into that electric elevator. At the same moment, the enormous commerce of our briskly modern world roared and thundered in the streets. Five seconds to noon, four seconds, three seconds, two seconds, one, zero. High noon in silence. All over the world, traffic stopped dead in a million streets. Here and there, a horse-drawn vehicle clopped its melancholy way among the motorless motors. Bicycles move. Before all in the common declaration, the riders stop of their own free will. Electric clocks stopped on the dot of noon. All across the powered world, the machines stood still. Toasters failed to pop. Battle fleets on maneuvers drifted aimlessly on their dead propellers. Joe Smith's milkshake didn't spin. And the humming turbines deep in Hoover Dam didn't produce current. Mrs. Housewife's washer stopped in the middle of its cycle. And the electric lights went out all over the world. At a conference table in Washington, a hasty council of the armed services was held. 
As far as we can tell, gentlemen, all electric power has been cut off all over with few exceptions. And even these exceptions are remarkable. Hospitals, planes in flight, that sort of thing. I wish I could be more specific, but all communications are out. I can tell you that we are preparing to declare a state of national emergency. But before we start discussing plans, I want a report from Colonel Ryder. All I can report, General, is that the robot at the spaceship was discovered to have moved last night. It knocked unconscious the two soldiers guarding the entrance to the shed the Army engineers had built around the spaceship, indicating that someone, presumably the spaceman, had wanted to get into the ship for one reason or another. In all likelihood, to signal for this demonstration of his planet's power. Go on, Colonel. Well, that's all, sir. Now, now, gentlemen, until now, we've agreed on the desirability of capturing this man alive. We can no longer afford to be soft in this matter. We will get him alive if possible, but we must get him. Is that clear, gentlemen? Dead or alive, get him. All over the world, electric power has been neutralized on the stroke of noon as a token of the spaceman's power and as a warning to the Earth. While they've been trapped between floors in an elevator, the spaceman has told Helen his identity and his purpose here. I've already told you more than I told Professor Barnhart because my life, in a sense, is in your hands. But if I die, a world, your world, may die too. Yes, I understand. I thought if you knew the facts, you'd appreciate the importance of my not being caught before the meeting tonight with the world's scientists. Yes, of course, of course I do. You hold great hope for this meeting, don't you? I can see no other hope for your planet. If the meeting should fail, then I'm afraid there is no hope. Oh, the lights, and we've started again. It must be 12.30. Yes, exactly. Where are you going now? Back to the boarding house. I'll be safe there for the afternoon. I'd be able to keep an eye on Bobby. He's the only other person who knows about me. No. Wait, wait a minute. There is someone else. How? There can't be. Tom. He was with me last night when Bobby told me what he saw. Well, of course he doesn't know anything definite, and, well, he talked to me first before... But then we can't take any chances, can we? Can you get in touch with him? I think so. I mean at once, now. I'll try. You will. You must. Hello? Hello? Operator? I was connected with my party. Please, hello? Oh, is this Mr. Stevens' office again? We were just go... Well, I must speak to Mr. C... No, no, Mr. Stevens. Yes, this is Mrs. Benson. Benson. Well, when do you expect him in then? Well, will you tell him I called and please do not leave his office. I'm coming down to see him. Yes, yes, it's very important to you too. <laughs> Margaret, this is Mr. Stevens. I just got in. Now listen, call the Pentagon. Who? Mrs. Benson? When? Oh, yeah, well, never mind that. This is much more important. Listen, call the Pentagon, find out who's in charge of this spaceman business, and whoever it is, I need to talk to him. Tom! Call me back right away, and don't take any of their calls. Tom, I've been trying to get you all afternoon. And I've got some pretty terrific news about your good friend, Mr. Carpenter. What about him? He's the man from the spaceship. You know, I had that diamond or whatever it was checked at three different places, and nobody on this earth has ever seen a stone like that. And after what Bobby told us, that's enough for me. Why is it that nobody knows anything about Mr. Carpenter? Why hasn't he got any money? All right, Tom, it's true. But how do you know? You've just got to promise me you won't say a word to anybody. Right. Nobody but the, the Pentagon. Please, Tom. Are you crazy? 
After what happened today, he's a menace. Oh, you don't understand. You don't realize how important this is. Important? Of course it's important, and we can do something about it. We mustn't do anything about it, Tom. Believe me, I know what I'm talking about. And I say he's dangerous, and it's our duty to turn him in. He isn't dangerous. He isn't a menace. He, he told me what he came here for. Oh, honey, don't be silly because you happen to like the guy. Don't you realize what this will mean for us? I'll be the biggest man in the whole country. I can write my own ticket. Is that what you're thinking about? Listen, somebody's got to get rid of him. Tom, I'm not going to let you do it. Tom, don't do it. Hello, Margaret? Yeah. General Cutler? Good. I'll hold on. You don't know what you're doing. It isn't just you and Mr. Carpenter. Mr. Carpenter. It's everybody. The rest of the world is involved. I don't give a hang about the rest of the world. I'm in this for me. Tom! Now, you'll feel different when you see my picture in the papers. <laughs> I feel different right now. Well, you'll see. You're going to marry a hero. I'm not going to marry anybody, not even a hero. Hey, Helen. Oh, hello? General Cutler? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. Um, this is Tom Stevens. That's Stevens with a V. And I, um, I have positive information about the spaceman and where he's staying. Right. Yeah. Of course I'm sure. He's living at a boarding house at 1615 M Street Northwest. That is correct, General. Yes, I have all of it now, Mr. Stevens, and thank you very much indeed. I'll want to talk to you further, but I haven't time now. We want to act on this. Yes, sir. Hey, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Have Colonel Ryder deploy all Zone 5 units according to Plan B immediately. Investigate 1615 M Street. Northwest for presence of spaceman. Repeat. Mr. Carpenter? Right here. Did you see Tom? What does he say? It's no good. It's it's too late. I've got a taxi waiting outside. Hurry. Attention, Zone 5. Zone 5, attention. Man and woman observed entering taxi at 1615 M Street Northwest. Man is probably Klaatu, alias Carpenter. Establish roadblocks according to Plan Baker and maintain station. Remain on a radio alert until further orders. I don't know. I think we might have been seen getting into the taxi. Where can you go? I'm sure Barnhart can arrange to hide me until the meeting tonight. Where is it going to be? At the ship. Now, there, look, army cars. Full troops in full gear. The alarm is out, all right. It's only a few more blocks to Professor Barnhart's. I'm really worried about Gort. I'm afraid of what he might do if anything should happen to me. Gort? He's a robot. He's a product of centuries of refinement. But what could he do without you? There's no limit to what he could do. He could destroy the Earth. And the city is swarming with patrol cars hunting you. How can we tell them? They won't listen. You must listen. If anything happens to me, you must go to Gort. You must give him this message. Klatu Barata Nikto. Gort. Klatu Barata Nikto. Say it. Gort. Klatu Barata. Nikto. Gort. Klatu Barata Nikto. Remember Klatu these Barada words. Nikto. Klatu Barata Nikto. Klatu Barata Nikto. Zone 5. Taxi cab moving north on 14th Street from Harvard Street. Man and woman in back seat. License number H0012. H0012. Section 2, close in. This is your target vehicle. We're hemmed in. Driver, we'll get out here. I'm going to try to run for it. If they get me, you get to Gort now. There he is. Stop him, shoot. Stop him, we'll fire. Mr. Carpenter! Gort, run. No. Never mind her. Check the guy. Klaatu Barada Nikto. Klaatu Barada Nikto. 
centuries. Ages of superhuman, superplanetary skill had bred intuition and a dim power of reason into this enormously complex intelligence inside of Gort's metal brain case. When Helen Benson stumbled up, up, stumbled up to the shed to house the machine, the guards were not there. And then she saw them. Why, they were lying inside. Their rifles were fused and bent. Gort somehow knew that Klaatu was dead. Gort was already on the move. He was on the move toward Helen. No! No, Gort, no! The visor of his helmet was opening in that cosmic incandescence within, seething with world ruin, aiming impassively at Helen. Gort! Gort! Klaatu! Klaatu Barada Barada! Nikto! Helen Benson fainted. When she returned her consciousness, she was lying on a dais, bathed in a soft, shadowless light in a chamber vaguely circular of completely unfamiliar build. She was in the space machine. Across the room stood Gort with his back to her, and lying in front of him on a platform was Klaatu. Mr. Carpenter. Gort the machine, the automaton was applying electrodes to his master, and a piercing, whining, maddening sound filled the ship. Klaatu moved. He sat up. He stood up. Mr. Carpenter! Hello? <gasps> I, I thought you were... I was. They took me to an emergency hospital in the city jail. Gort broke in and took me back here. This technique can restore life in some cases, but only for a limited time. How long? Time enough, no one can tell. And more for me to go outside and speak to Professor Barnhart's scientists. I must speak to them. It's what I came for. Gort will put up the ramp. You, people of Earth, you men of science, you are here from all over your world, Europe, Asia, the United States of America, representing many nations, many ideas. I am leaving soon, so you will forgive me if I speak bluntly. The universe grows smaller every day. Where I come, we believe there must be security for all, or no one, no one is secure. This does not mean giving up any freedom, except the freedom to act irresponsibly. This is the message that I ask you to take back when you return to your native lands. Tell your people and your governments that we have created a race of robots whose sole function is to patrol the planets in spaceships to preserve the peace. The first sign of treachery, they will act automatically. Nothing, nothing you have on Earth can stop them. Penalty for provoking their action is too terrible to risk. Your choice is simple. Live in peace or die in violence. We shall be waiting for your answer. The decision rests with you. Gort, Barango. Remember. I'll remember, Mr. Carpenter. And as they had seen him come, so did they see him depart and the people of the earth pondered upon the warning. Mm -hmm.